Christ is risen, dear viewers of this series of uh, open public lectures uh, presented and organized by the Center of Ecumenical, Missiological and Environmental Studies, SEMES, uh, honoring the great uh, ecumenical figure of uh, the Diocese of Thessaloniki, Greece, uh, Metropolitan Pandeleimon Papageorgiou, who was a pioneer back in the 50s um, in the ecumenical relations. As I have uh, done during the last uh, Greek-speaking uh, presentation last week, I will do the same reminding our viewers what are the main recommendations that we are going to uh, make to the bishops of the old and the new Rome. Also, I will present to you, I will make uh, um, uh, a share screen. Um, This is the booklet we have prepared and we are going to uh, dedicate to His All Holiness, the uh, Patriarch, the Ecumenical Patriarch uh, Bartholomew, but we will also give it to uh, His Holiness uh, Pope Francis. The executive summary of, the, of some proposals to the bishops of the old and the new Rome during these uh, academic years uh, open public lectures, very briefly is as follows. You can see also that we have been engaged both Catholics, uh, Orthodox Orientals, Orthodox and also Greek Catholics. Reverend Professor Heising Destivel suggested that when the Catholic Church speaks of imperfect communion, it means an ontological and spiritual communion in faith, sacraments, and ministries, which is real, though incomplete, as it is not yet manifested in the canonical and the Eucharistic communion. And this is also what was repeated by Orthodox uh, scholars who have suggested at least to proceed to a Eucharistic um, hospitality. Uh, Emeritus Professor Father K.M. George from the Oriental Orthodox Church responded to this. He said that I attach great importance to an evolutionary view of our past conflicts and divisions with a view to experience the healing and unity of the church as the one body of Christ in true faith, forgiveness, and love. Also, <clears throat> the Archbishop of Tel Mesos, Uh, Professor Job Getza, he spoke about uh, in anticipation uh, of uh, the uh, 1700th anniversary of the first ecumenical council that Pope Francis, ecumenical patriarch, are planning to celebrate in 2025 in Nicaea, the common celebration of Pascha is an urgent need and uh, af uh, it should be celebrated after the first full moon of spring using for calculating the date 
the astronomical data, spring, equinox, and full moon, and to develop the most accurate scientific data in Jerusalem place of Christ's resurrection. Professor Dimitrios Kiaramidas, uh, also from uh, Angelicum, he said that the reasons for the break of communion between the Catholic and the Orthodox Church were of political, cultural, linguistic, and theological nature. The term estrangement describes the interaction between these factors that led to the episode of 1054 and eventually to the division between the Greek and the Latin Church. But if separation is first lived and then declared, also unity can and will be first lived and then formally declared. The director of the Pro Oriente, uh, Reverend Dr. Giacomo Pulici, said that Pope Francis has provided new regulations enforcing stronger implication, including remo removal from office for those in the leadership. The accountability of leadership within the local church is very much vertically understood. Yet, if the church is moving from a hierarchical to a more synodal understanding, the question needs to be raised as to what this may imply for being held accountable. On my part, uh, I suggested that for many centuries, especially in the second half of the second millennium, we Orthodox have unconsciously developed a negative Orthodox identity. We are not what the Bible and our tradition have left us as a legacy, but what the others, mainly the Catholics, are not. In other words, without primacy, the visible expression of the church's unity, accompanied, of course, by conciliarity. And also, I made a recommendation that the new Rome must unilaterally, without consulting the other autocephalous Orthodox churches, heal the non-existing schism, as we will say later on, with the old Rome, the way our churches lifted the anathemas in the past. One of the main debaters today, uh, Emeritus Professor Andrei Kravchuk, suggested that since its origin in the undivided Christianity of the old Rome, Ukraine's religious dynamics have been determined by centrifugal factors I, sorry, uh, centrifugal factors of geography in 1054 and power uh, later in the 16th century and by centripetal forces of reconciliation again in the 15th and 16th centuries. In the present war, independent Ukraine is demonstrating agency and the will to restore unity in communion with the new Rome. And uh, also his colleague from the Greek Catholic, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church uh, and director of the um, Ecumenical Relations uh, Office, uh, Ihor Saban, said that no one knows what the future of the Orthodox Catholic dialogue will be like, but we do know in what direction this dialogue should develop. Its goal was and remains to restore full and visible unity between the Western Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. As unions, he said, we now know that this old model of unity cannot be applied today in the ecumenical era. And we are very delighted by Pope Francis' conciliar process that is now going on in the Catholic Church. My colleague and the Secretary of SEMES, uh, Reverend Professor <coughs> Augustinus Bayraktari, said that the unity of Christianity is like a marathon 
with a lot of faces and miles to run. The ecclesiology of sister churches and Chiara Lubick's notions of Jesus forsaken and the spirituality of unity, as well as the vision of the ecumenical patriarch Athenagoras on Christian unity are examples to be imitated today for our church's journey towards Eucharistic union. Reverend Professor Stylianos Muxuris said that commemorating non-Orthodox names in the Eucharistic service of Proscomidi brings us face to face with the problem of the boundaries, or the charismatic boundaries of the church and sacramental grace in a new perspective. One cannot embrace the world in theory and simultaneously remain xenophobic, not acknowledging our common humanity and refusing to stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters who, although different from us, will share our imperfections and struggles, but also our aspirations. Dr. Ali Kateuts um, suggested that the continued restoration of the order of women deacons has popular support not only among the laity in both Eastern Orthodox and Western Catholic Church communities, but in recent years also by Pope Francis' institution of two commissions to consider their restoration. This initiative, as well as similar ones in the East, quite likely will not only lead the way for the West, but also would help unify East and West in the desire to return to the practices of the unified early church, practices seen in art in both East and West. Father Cyril Hoverung, the Ukrainian professor and well-known colleague of our main speaker today, said that the schism between East and the West was in making for centuries. I would argue, he said, that it started with the Akakian schism toward the end of the fifth century and was accomplished only in the 18th century. Then the churches of both Old and New Rome officially refused to recognize all sacraments of each other. This schism is being undone approximately 10 times faster than it was done. This gives us hope, he said, that we could restore our unity sooner or later. And also for few more important recommendations from the Greek, by the Greek speaking uh, presentations. And with this, I will end my very short introduction. Professor Larenzakis concluded that there is no canonical or ecclesiological schism. Orthodox and Catholic are real sister churches. Since then, since there is no real canonical schism, the, it is easier to reunite it rather than go on in discussing uh, minute problems. The Catholic Archbishop of the Greek Catholics here, Reverend uh, um, Archbishop uh, uh, and Professor Emeritus Ioannis Piteris, proposed that the Catholic Church should not ignore the ancient pentarchy, but also he hopes that Pope Francis, with his um, energetic and prophetic mind, should return his title of uh, uh, the Pope as also the Patriarch of the West, as a gesture to the uh, Orthodox Church. A professor at the University of Athens, uh, Dimitrios Moskos, suggested that we should not underestimate the political, socioeconomic factors that contributed to the Rome-Constantinople 
estrangement by creating a crypto theology, as he said, and developing further counter arguments against each other. And also his colleague at the University of uh, uh, Athens, Stavros Yagazoglu, suggested that we should abandon the style and content of the all dividing our church's arguments and follow the traditional gospel message until we have a full Eucharistic communion. And finally, Sister Dr. Theologia, uh, a member from the monastic community of Semes, underlined the correctness of both Eastern and Western churches' attempt to reinstitute the traditional order of women deacons, reminding us Saint Nona's example who died on the holy table of uh, his son, Patriarch of Constantinople, uh, Saint Gregory the Theologian. This is uh, what I wanted to uh, say uh, and remind our viewers and listeners about uh, what we have done. Now, allow me to briefly, very briefly, introduce uh, our main speaker today. Um, <clears throat> Professor Antoine Azakovsky is a research director at the College of Bernardines in Paris and founding director of, and also uh, emeritus uh, director of the Institute of Ecumenical Studies in Lviv, in his uh, native country, Ukraine. Uh, from his many books, I will uh, um, remind our viewers only few. The most important, although the, the whole of his bibliography is uh, great and extensive. Uh, what is orthodoxy? Question mark, a genealogy of the Christian understanding, which was uh, uh, a little bit earlier book. Um, and uh, also his new book, uh, which uh, is just been public, published, and uh, his presentation will uh, exactly uh, um, be is based uh, uh, on these uh, ideas he's, he's presenting uh, now to the general uh, Orthodox and uh, general ecumenical public towards an ecumenical metaphysics, the principles and methods of ecumenical science. And of course, uh, we should not uh, um, forget uh, one of his main uh, books uh, he wrote uh, just uh, after the uh, new independence of Ukraine, Russia, Ukraine, from war to peace, um, which uh, has uh, uh, analyze the situation, giving credit also to the uh, Greek Catholic uh, uh, community that has suffered under the Rus Russian domination. But also his other books, uh, um, uh, especially um, the one on uh, um, cult church, culture, and identity reflections on orthodoxy in modern world, and of course, uh, essays on Father Serge Bulgakov, Christian philosopher and theologian, and also the uh, booklet uh, uh, books uh, that uh, he has uh, uh, published, uh, um, giving, uh, giving the, the West an idea of the Russian or the diaspora, a generation of religious thinkers from Russian immigration. Uh, the Lavoie magazine, uh, which was uh, uh, been published from 1925 to 1940. Antoine, the 
floor is now yours uh, and uh, we are expecting you to speak about uh, ecumenical metaphysics uh, and the prospects of reunion. The floor is yours now. yourself you are not hurt okay okay hello everybody thank you thank you petros i'm glad to be with you i'm glad to have this opportunity uh, to speak in this seminar on this question of ecumenical metaphysics and church union uh, thank you to have uh, say a few words about my latest book I have it with me, this book, Towards an Ecumenical Metaphysics, which is the translation of this big book that was published in French, Essai de Métaphysique Ecumenique. And now there is a, a short book about the question, what is ecumenism? Qu'est-ce que l'ecumenisme? And, um, you know, I'm rather critical, although it's already more than 30 years I am in the ecumenical movement, as you know, Today, I, I see not only the winter of the ecumenical movement, but a deep crisis of this ecumenical movement. And I think it is necessary in the 30 minutes that you gave me to reflect a little bit, first of all, on this crisis, and then to see how through a new discipline, the ecumenical metaphysics, we can uh, overcome this crisis and prepare the future. I, I will give just an example because uh, you know that I follow what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, recently, we have seen the difficulties for the Pope himself to define a, a strategy of reconciliation that would be uh, accepted by Ukrainians. Uh, the Pope said that we are all responsible for what's happening in Ukraine. And the Ukrainians answered, it's not true. We are not responsible. There is a Russia who is attacking us and we are not responsible for this. We are the victim and not the aggressor. So this is an example which shows the difficulties even for the Pope to, to, to have a new strategy uh, in order to make peace and reconciliation. But you know, from the Orthodox side, it's not very, very good at, at also the, the, the Moscow Patriarchate, the Patriarch Kirill is promoting this heresy of the Russian world. I am one of the theologians among many others in the Orthodox world who have signed this document against this heresy uh, of the Russian world. Uh, it, it, it is a, a very big problem that now the Moscow Patriarchate is blessing this war in Ukraine and, uh, and there is no reaction. The ecumenical movement is not reacting. The WCC is not excluding the Moscow Patriarchate as many people were asking, for instance, Archbishop Rowan Williams. And on the contrary, recently in Crete, the, all the churches received Metropolit Ilarion Alfeyev as one among us, uh, as if there was no schism between uh, Moscow and Constantinople. And more recently, yesterday, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate published a, a document where there was no critics towards uh, Patriarch Kirill, the only critics was towards against uh, President Poroshenko, which shows again that there is no sense of history inside the, the Orthodox Church today. So this is why I need really to reflect on what is ecumenism. Um, and I would like to say three things today, how we could overcome this crisis. First of all, first of all uh, we need to understand that the phenomenon of universality, which is the main meaning of ecumenism, the phenomenon of universality in truth and justice needs a special science. This science cannot be only ecclesiology, 
it should be an ecumenical metaphysics. And I will develop why it is not possible to have only ecclesiology, interdenominational ecclesiology in order to think what is the ecumenical movement. The other thing I would like to say today is that it means that true metaphysics should be rehabilitated, which is a big challenge because our philosophers, but also our modern theologians, they are not in favor of metaphysics. They are criticizing metaphysics. So this is why we need to understand what should be the, the true metaphysics, which is for me an ecumenical one. And only when we will do this work, when we will agree on the need of this new science of ecumenical metaphysics, then we can start to see um, uh, the contour of the unity of the churches, the unity, as you said, between the second and the first Rome. But here we will have a surprise. The, the, the common ecclesiology of faith and order, for instance, is to reach visible unity. And I think it's an illusion. We don't have to agree on everything in order to pray and act together in a visible manner. We need, first of all, to believe in God, in Jesus Christ, in order to be able to see this already present visible and invisible unity. And this is a shift of paradigm. The, the, I consider that this uh, focalization on visibility is a problem uh, which explains the, the, the winter of ecumenism. So the first, the first thing I would like to say today is that ecumenical reality is larger than what modern ecclesiology uh, say about ecumenism. And first of all, we need to understand that oikumene has five different meanings. The most frequent understanding of ecumenism is what churches are saying since the 19th century, that it is a, a movement of unity between different denominations that started in the 19th century and that gave some important conferences like in uh, in Edinburgh in 1910 or during the 1920 when the, the, the Patriarch of Constantinople make, made this appeal for the unity of the Churches of Christ and later with the Vatican II Council. But usually we consider that this definition of ecumenism it does not concern the other religions. It's only among Christians. And it's about unity and uh, uh, separations. But the, the first meaning, the, the meaning of Herodot, the, the Greek historians who wrote his histories in the fifth century be, be before Jesus Christ, was to, to speak about oikumene as the whole inhabited land, which gave a, a larger view of oikumene. It is an, a, a, a geographic meaning, but also an ecological meaning. And this is why today ecologists are speaking in this spirit of oikumene as inhabited land. And uh, um, we, we forget in the ecumenical movement about this ecological also dimension. Then the, the, the other meaning was a political meaning, the meaning of Plutarch who was, as you know, a, a Greek historian who wrote in the, seven, in the second century before Jesus Christ. And he was speak, speaking about oikumene as a place for civilization. And for him, the civilization was the civilization of the Roman, Roman Empire. So this is the meaning that the, 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 the for instance, the Byzantium included when the, the emperor was uh, defined as the ecumenical emperor or the patriarch of Constantinople was understood as the ecumenical patriarch. It was in this meaning of a political dimension of ecumenism. 
But then the, there is a third, well, already a fourth meaning, um, but historically a, a third one. When the, the, the Christians, the changed the situation by imagining that this space of civilization was still to come. The author of the epistle to the Hebrews announced the coming oikumene. It is in the epistle of the Hebrews 2.5. And the coming oikumene for him was the kingdom of God on the earth. He wrote, it is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. The oikumene that comes means the kingdom of God on the earth. This is why for the fathers of the churches, oikumene concern now universality in space, but also in time, in spirit and truth, which means both church and Catholicity. But what is important for me is that the, the first general secretary of the World Council of Churches, Wissert Hooft, he spoke about a new meaning for oikumene. He spoke about an ecumenical faith. The, the oikumene means for Wissert Hooft the conscience and the desire for Christian unity beyond all kinds of denominations. And he was uh, quoting the Gospel of John 12, 31, 32. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the prince of this world will be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw everyone to myself. We are going out of the limits of Christian denominations. Here, Jesus Christ is attracting everybody on the earth. Uh, and Wiesert Hooft is also quoting the first epistle to Corinthians. The body is a unit, though it is composed of many parts. And although its parts are many, they all form one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Which means that it goes beyond the limits of churches, of denom denominations, of nations also. So this is what is important for me as the first thing I wanted to say today is that the ecumenical movement goes beyond what usually churches are saying about it. So this is why interconfessional ecclesiology is not the right tool in order to understand the reality of the oikumene. And this is why we need now a true metaphysics. As you know, metaphysics was uh, um, uh, destroyed in the 20th century by Heidegger in his book, Etre et Temps, Time and Being. He criticized the Thomist, but also the idealist ontotheology, the conceptualization of being, which gave all power to technology in modern civilization. But it's not only philosophers like Heidegger who criticized uh, metaphysics. It is also theologians um, who were criticizing uh, metaphysics, the, the, the classical metaphysics that was uh, uh, separating on one side the, the sphere of the how, which was for theologians and the sphere uh, which was the sphere of the philosophers and the sphere of the why, which was the, the domain of the theologians. So this is already, that was already a problem for modern philosophers like Emmanuel Kant. Uh, it was a kind of schizophrenia uh, between theology and philosophy. 
the two spheres of belief and rationality. But Kant himself, at the, at the end of his life, in the conflict of the faculties, opposed such a division. He, the philosopher of the pure reason, explained that he was also a, a Lutheran believer, a pietist believer, who would like to be able to discuss with theologians. But the misfortune was that at his time, theological rationality was entirely dependent on the political power. Today, we are no longer here. On the contrary, we see how much theological rationality and philosophical rationality have things to say to each other. Hence, the interest for me of thinking today about the basis of an ecumenical metaphysics uh, are here. To achieve this, theologians must first recognize that modern ecclesiology is not able to grasp in all its depth the question underlying the communical movement of the kingdom of God on the earth. This is what I was saying by quoting the epistle to the Hebrews. But philosophers also must understand for their part that their enthusiasm in the 20th century for the deconstruction of modern metaphysics especially in France with uh, Derrida or Michel Foucault, is not sufficient in itself to find the path of truth leading to the spirit. It is rather for the former as for the later to rehabilitate authentic wisdom, the ruder of faith reason as a source of intelligence and fulfillment, the real orthodoxy. This rehabilitation of the orthodox faith reason consequently produces a new narrative, eschatological and progressive, of ecumenical consciousness. The main originality of my book, I think, is to show that metaphysics, when defined as ecumenical, is able to hold together the personalism of Nikolai Berdyaev, the sociology of Father Sergius Bulgakov, and the transdisciplinary approach of the included third of Lev Shestov. Metaphysics for Aristotle had to be catalou, universal, ecumenical. It had to be able to take the whole thing as for the Christian, when they believe, they say their creed, je crois en un seul Dieu et je crois en une seule église, I believe in one church, the Russians and the Ukrainians are saying, I believe in a, an ecumenical church, in a Sobornaya Tserkov. Metaphysics, when it rediscovers its spiritual sources in this personalistic, sociological and ternary way, precisely becomes fully ecumenical. Just as in Catholic ecclesiology, there is several meaning of Catholicity as Cardinal Dulles clearly showed. Um, and since Vatican II has resolved to conceive its universality in an ecumenical mode, the same is true for metaphysics, which can no longer be fully universal unless it's ecumenical dimension, unless it's personalist dimension. This approach makes it possible to reconcile four major understanding of truth in the history of philosophy. And you know, this is particularly important for me because we are living this war also because of the post-truth world. There is no belief anymore in the possibility of truth. This is why it is important through ecumenical metaphysics to take together four understanding of truth. Truth, first of all, as correspondence between the thing and the intellect. That was the definition of Aristotle. But there was another definition of truth as fidelity to a promise, 
faithfulness to a promise that was in Augustine, but it all it was also in the Old Testament. There is a third understanding of truth as co coherence between what one says and what one does. That was particularly important in pragmatic and positivist philosophy in Russia, for instance. And finally, there is the understanding of truth as consensus between the members of a community. You can find this in Pierce in particular. So the ecumenical metaphysics is holding together these four understanding of truth and this existential and intention conception of truth is opposed in this sense to the voluntarist vision of truth, which no longer conceives of it except in a technocentric way as what works in relation to what is in Bacon, a vision which leads today to a transhumanist utopia. So that was, you know, a short presentation of what can bring this ecumenical metaphysics, which is a rehabilitation of metaphysics. What are the consequences of the rehabilitation of metaphysics for a new ecumenical ecclesiology and not comparative ecclesiology as usually it is taught in the Christian universities. Ecumenical ecclesiology, because it is personalist, sociological, and turn Trinitarian, propose a transdisciplinary approach. The churches must understand on the one hand that they themselves are crossed by contradictory currents which call into question their cohesion. And not only inside the Orthodox Church, we find the same problem in the Catholic or in the Anglican world. There are these different contradictory currents because of different representation of what is the church that are less and less united between themselves in the modern ecclesiology. There is, first of all, the understanding of church as the arc of salvation. There is the church understood as the body of Christ, which is the main understanding of the church today by Christian institutions. There is also the understanding of church as the house of the father. All these definitions you can find in, in the gospel. And finally, you can find also the definition of the church as the temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, the same as for the philosophical understanding of truth, we need together to hold together these four understanding of church, body of Christ, temple of the Holy Spirit, ark of the salvation, and house of the Father. What allows us to make it is metaphysics. If you understand in a mystical way the church as the spouse of the lamb, neviesta ansa, l'épouse de l'agneau, then you are able to unite God and history, the divine wisdom with the created wisdom. That was the main proposal of Bulgakov in his latest book. The churches no longer understand themselves in this mystical logic. And they need to reach this new level of consciousness that allow them to hold together these four definitions of the church. And then, as Petros Vasiliadis is insisting in, and I support him and I appreciate very much when he insists on the idea to hold together the pole of the liturgy, liturgia, with the pole of martyria, of witness, the pole of diaconia, the service of charity, with the pole of koinonia, the pole of communion. That is possible only when you hold together 
these four definitions of the church. And when you have this mystical understanding of divino humanity, of the created wisdom reaching for the divine wisdom. In this perspective, in this ecumenical metaphysics, the churches are no longer in a, in a competitive game of capturing souls. They work together for the transfiguration of the world, for the mission, as Petros is insisting in his papers. They become a traveling field hospital, as Pope Francis says. They remember in this new eschatological conception of the church as divino humanity on the move that their task is to bring about the kingdom of God on the earth. They also cease to be obsessed with the obligation to make their unity visible because in this new eschatological vision of the church, it is no longer said that the kingdom is here or that it is there. Indeed, the kingdom does not impose itself on sight. It is a spiritual reality. Christ said to his disciples, the kingdom of God is among you, is in your midst. Modern ecclesiology, fundamentally institutional and cut off from political power, then becomes not only an embodied reality, but also a relational reality in dialogue with all the authority of the century. You, 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 you understand this is important. If you sh keep together visible and invisible reality, then you can think together also cooperation and separation between political power and mystical power. You have to believe in order to see and not the other way around. Jean-Luc Marion, the, phenomen the French phenomenologist, wrote a lot of papers on this question. The problem is that the ecumenical institutional movement says, on the contrary, that you need first to see and then to believe. That is not what is written in the Gospels and in the books of the Acts. Ecumenical metaphysics, therefore, has the advantage of bringing the churches out of the current ecumenical winter. Conversely, we observe that the churches which understand themselves as universal denomination are increasingly weakened by a number of processes, starting with the process of secularization and globalization. But ecumenical ecclesiology proposes to the churches to maintain the course of faithful memory to the Pope, to the scriptures, to the conciliar tradition, which is the basis of their confessional organization. But it also proposed to them to maintain these three poles together in an ecclesiology intention capable of uniting the four main definitions of faith. Faithful memory, of course, to the Pope, to the councils, to the scriptures, but also just glorification, pravoslavie, rightful truth, orthodoxia, and fair knowledge, which is also pravavirnist. The church understood as the bride of the land, as divino humanity, can then hold together the four self-consciousness of the churches, as body of Christ, temple of the Holy Spirit, ark of salvation, and house of the Father. So let me conclude. I would like to come back to the question of uh, the possible role of the churches in fostering unity and peace, especially in Ukraine. The ecumenical method of building peace can no longer be that of simple balance that tries to establish justice by giving everyone his share from the outside. Now, in this metaphysical approach, it becomes a prophetic commitment to the truth, a sharp judgment capable of condemning the aggressors and consoling the victims. Concerning the Ukrainian-Russian war, 
It is wrong to, to assert that everyone is today responsible for the viol violence unleashed in Ukraine. Ukrainians have indeed been victims since in 2014, the Russian state decided to invade their territory, denying them even the right to exist as a free and independent nation. Those who have blessed and encouraged such violence must be punished and condemned. Conversely, we must thank those who, like the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, were able, at the risk of being harshly criticized, to grant their trust and their recognition to the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. And through her, to the whole Ukrainian nation that was building its identity as a nation state. To build a peace in an ecumenical way today, it is necessary to say the truth, to commit ourselves to ensuring that justice is done, especially on the crimes of communism, but also on the genocide that we are seeing today in Ukraine. This is the world the words of the, the parliament of Ukraine to speak about a genocide in Ukraine. And of course, to be a radiant witness to the love of Christ so that the kingdom of God may be accomplished, of course, not only in Ukraine, but everywhere in the world, including Russia, in Sarov and Mariupol. The churches in Ukraine show that they have sufficient resources to dare to speak the truth, to resist in the face of satanic violence without giving in to the blindness of hatred. The most eminent example of this power from heaven can be found in the speeches of peace that have been given since the beginning of the conflict by all the re religious leaders in Ukraine. Among the latter, allow me to conclude by quoting the beautiful homily delivered by Bishop Sviatoslav Shevchuk, the head of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church on May 5, 2022, on the 31st day of the war launched by Russia against Ukraine. So I quote him. Today, in the midst of despair, war and pain, I would like to reflect with you on the final beatitude of the gospel, which sounds as an encouragement and blessing. A beatitude that sums up and then crowns all those proclaimed gospel beatitudes about the action of God in the human person. This beatitude says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Today, even though we are celebrating Pascha, it is not easy for us to rejoice and be glad. Rather, we feel like being sad and crying, but we feel that this joy that Jesus Christ tells us as a beatitude is not just a human emotion. This is not entertainment. This joy is the presence of the kingdom of heaven among us and the presence of the eternal and joyous life already in man today. This is a reward we should rejoice in the reward that we will be in its fullness in heaven is not something distant and unknown to us. We already have this heavenly reward as a deposit, like that seed, perhaps the seed that has yet to fall to the ground and must die and be born. But that seed is already there and the very feeling of the presence of heavenly power of God's life here among us in this valley of tears in the midst of the grief of death is the cause of our joy. We hope for the fullness of that which we already have. We rejoice in that which the Lord God has already begun, his work, his presence, that he began his kingdom here on earth, among us. And that is why we are called to build and spread this joy, end of quote. You know, for me, it is just beautiful. And it is an example that inside the war, 
when churches become prophetic and remind that the goal is not themselves, is not the visible institutional church, but the coming of the kingdom of God on the earth, then we have a, a, a spring of the ecumenical movement. The unity of the churches will occur, or rather will be discovered when ecumenical metaphysics will have sufficiently penetrated consciences for such a discourse to be, to be grasped by all Christians and all believers as authentically orthodox and life-giving. Thank you for your attention. We thank you, Antoine, for your uh, insightful and perfect concluding this series of uh, open public lectures uh, on the way towards the unity of the One Church of Christ. You have uh, actually, with your <coughs> ecumenical metaphysical approach, uh, I would rather say also the philosophical uh, substantiation of what uh, the other uh, uh, presentations from historical, canonical, and uh, theological uh, point of view uh, have come to the conclusion that there is no obstacle towards the church unity, especially if we understand uh, the eschatological dimension you have just described with the kingdom of God, and uh, which is also, just one very short comment, is uh, also um, um, uh, explained by the nature of aletheia, of the truth, uh, which is in our, let's say, orthodox liturgical uh, practice we remember not only past things, but also the future, the coming of the kingdom, the coming of the second coming in the anaphora. And this is uh, something which is uh, a reverse of the Greek word aletheia, meaning a, uh, not, uh, not uh, forgetting, meaning that we always should forget the past, the, 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 um, our uh, history, our past, but also concentrating on our goal, the uh, eschatological kingdom. Uh, a very short comment now by our uh, um, uh, first uh, debater, um, Emeritus Professor uh, Andre Kratzuk, the floor is yours now to set, say a short comment, and then we will move to a practical um, summarizing what you have theoretically uh, presented, uh, how this can be uh, um, uh, go uh, in a pastoral and further practical way. Um, Professor uh, Nikolos Dimitriadis will uh, then, after uh, Professor Kravchuk, uh, say uh, a very uh, short but a little bit elaborated comment on the theology of leadership towards the same goal you have presented. Um, Andre, the floor is yours now. And then, uh, uh, after uh, Nikolaos, uh, uh, also. Um, um, Antoine will uh, close uh, our uh, um, today's uh, present um, event. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vasiliadis uh, and uh, Professor Arzakovsky. I've heard of you and read some of your work. Um, I, it's a pleasure and honor to meet you finally today and to hear such a wonderful, uh, masterful presentation. I have to admit, I think you won't be surprised like many, uh, well, even theologians uh, today, uh, we are not in the habit of, of thinking about metaphysics on a daily basis. Uh, but uh, my own entry point uh, is uh, more along the lines of the, uh, 
the more practical uh, applications of, of your, your very profound uh, insights and uh, 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 reminders to us, very valuable reminders about uh, some of the insights that have uh, been developed over uh, centuries and millennia, even before Christianity. About, uh, about unity, about the nature of the church and so forth. Um, in your uh, closing remarks, I especially uh, appreciated uh, the uh, return to the themes of the commitment to truth and uh, also um, the idea that if we are talking about the implications of this metaphysics, uh, uh, ecumenical metaphysics, we, are, taught, we, we are, are situating ourselves uh, not just within the bounds of the visible church, but we are actually daring ourselves. We are allowing ourselves to think beyond those limits. And I think that's a very, very uh, compelling, very powerful um, entry point and a principle uh, that, uh, that can be very constructive for, for people who are working uh, trying to make sense in the Ukrainian context of what uh, unity can possibly look like as it changes. You mentioned yesterday's synod of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, and uh, of course it's a, it's a dynamic movement. Uh, the, the, uh, the war of words, the propaganda, and the, and the way in which the discourses and narratives of Russian Orthodoxy are being uh, moved away from uh, a kind of maybe the bearings, the origins. You talked about uh, the Russian philosophers, Berdyaev, Bulgakov, and other people who, who you know, uh, uh, enriched the uh, Russian tradition. And now this tradition is being pulled into a different direction. Um, I think one of the uh, questions, if we had more time to discuss, I would be, I would be uh, very uh, happy to uh, discuss further at another context, uh, would be about the, um, uh, uh, the painful reality that uh, the, the, especially Ukrainian Catholics are experiencing, that the Pope is not uh, uh, apparently able to appreciate uh, that uh, uh, his, uh, his um, kind of detached way of, of describing the uh, conflict is, is itself, just the description is a, is a painful uh, lack of acknowledgement uh, for uh, many people inside Ukraine, Catholic and non-Catholic. Uh, and and um, uh, kind of, uh, uh, maybe giving way to uh, the Russian point of view. And I think this is something that I'm, I'm not an expert in ecumenism. You know, I don't have the years of experience that you have, but this is also one of the things that I think Ukrainian Catholics and others have, have uh, held against uh, the Vatican in its ecumenical initiatives with Moscow um, and, and the anxiety of, of Rome not to break ties even now with those uh, ecumenical kind of initiatives. Um, so uh, we have a crisis really uh, of truth, it would seem. And the question is, how is it possible to, uh, on the one hand, to critique the Pope if you are a Catholic? On the other hand, how is it possible how do we? How did? Do, how does theology? How does has been ecumenical metaphysics equip us to address the necessary critique of the perpetrator and the creator of the war? But I have an additional concern, which is the concern that we don't fall into a language of victimization and perpetual victimization. And this war was launched against us. And long before this war, we were victims for many centuries. And the perpetrator was always Russia. So there's a fundamental um, kind of uh, issue there, even in Ruski Mir, even in many of the, you know, the Pan-Slavic idea and all of this, there is, or there are the seeds of a Christian ecumene, ecumene. There are the seeds of, of fundamental unity of Kievan Christianity there is, and, and Christianity in that area of the world. So 
in the, in the words of Patriarch Kirill, which are geopolitically um, kind of shaped and determined, there, it, there are the grains of this unity as well. And if we throw out kind of, to use a phrase in English, uh, the baby with the bathwater, uh, if we throw everything out, then actually we will be losing some of the truth. Of course, that truth has been distorted in a, in a profound way. But if we want to move towards a unity, it is my intuition. I, I haven't, you know, developed this thinking very, very greatly. But it is, it is a sense that I have that if there is a future for Ukrainian-Russian uh, relations, whether inside Ukraine or in between the two nations, uh, we will inevitably have to come back in our political language, in our theological language, in other, you know, uh, uh, in our in our uh, metaphysical uh, ecumenism or ecumenical metaphysics, uh, to the, the these these discourses and terminology that unify those people who are now um, unable to think what peace may look like. You know, when when you listen to the to the uh, uh, president and so forth, there, there is uh, kind of an idea, we have to get through this war and then we will settle our terms and it will just take time. They, they don't have any other solution except time, you know, that's... Uh, so anyway, I apologize for a little bit of a ramble, but I guess uh, I was given a limited time and I look forward, I, ho I do hope we'll be in touch in one way or another and we can discuss because it's very stimulating what you presented and I appreciate and thank you very much again. And we thank you for your uh, comment, uh, uh, Andre. Uh, now, I would like to uh, give to Nikolaos uh, Dimitriadis uh, the floor, uh, because we decided to combine the theoretical uh, approach uh, to the issue we are discussing the whole academic year, the, um, and which was so beautifully uh, presented by uh, Professor Adakovic, uh, with uh, some practical or pastoral uh, concern uh, with uh, uh, what uh, uh, Nikolos Dimitriadis, the President of uh, the Center of Ecumenical, Missiological, and Environmental Studies uh, will uh, uh, say to us. But before, before I give the floor to him, um, uh, allow me um, uh, to. Uh, I don't know what is this. No. <coughs> No, no. Nikolaos, are you ready? Yes, yes, Professor. To make uh, your comment, but also uh, present uh, your uh, paper with which uh, uh, we will close uh, today's uh, event. And then uh, Professor um, Antoine will uh, uh, respond uh, at the end. Uh, and we will also add some uh, more comments uh, uh, if the time allows. Now, Nicolas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Vasiliadis. We'd like to thank uh, cordially Professor Azakovsky uh, for his very insightful uh, speech and uh, Mel Professor Andrei Krauts also for- Your camera, comment. please, if it's possible. <laughs> Right. Can you see me here now? Okay, yes, we are fine. Yeah, okay. Um, so I was saying that uh, I would like to, to thank uh, both the speaker and the commentators. And as uh, president of SEMES, though, I will grab the opportunity to thank all speakers uh, for the lectures and uh, all people that participated in those uh, open public lectures of, uh, of SEMES. 
And um, unfortunately, I realized, can you still see me now? No, no, you are okay. still without camera. Okay. I... But, now, but now, now you can see me, right? Yes, now you, okay. we can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know. Okay, so um, unfortunately, we needed a war to realize that uh, something is lacking. And uh, both I realize in the ecumenical movement, and uh, I realize also every day in the discussion we have among uh, other Orthodox scholars. And uh, Luckily, though, we're, uh, you know, we realize this and we're trying, you know, to find solutions and uh, to make some uh, comments and, like you said, uh, to, uh, to try to apply all of those things to the unity of the, of the Church of Christ. So, um, my lecture, they have, they have much time to, to prepare the lecture, but I accept it as, as some sort of reflections and comments. Uh, based on what um, we call theology of uh, leadership in a religious diverse uh, world. So uh, how do we understand, first of all, this theology, a theology of leadership? And uh, in order to answer this question, we should primarily define those terms. So yes, theology, I mean, I'm addressing to theologians now, but theology is the prophetic voice of the church. And Leadership is the action of leading. And what defines leadership is the ability to influence others. So someone would expect that a theology of leadership has to do with spiritual guidance. But the recent events of the Russian invasion in Ukraine showed us that a religious leader can use its ability to influence in both spiritual and non-spiritual, the secular aspects of life, the latter being in relation with the state and, and so on. So inevitably, uh, they are both spiritual and non-spiritual non on a parallel road. Uh, but as in, uh, in mathematics, we say that where parallel lines intersect in infinity, by the same token, the spiritual matters and non-spiritual matters need to be seen as connected. And this leads us to the importance of a theology of leadership in a religious diverse world, underlying the responsibility of a leader toward, towards religious pluralism. And when I say leader, I don't mean the church hierarchy. I mean, uh, like Professor Zakowski said, the body of Christ. So in the Christian world, the models of uh, leadership and the personalities of leaders are diverse in scripture and in church history. And each one of us uh, have different ideas on what is faith-based leadership in a pluralistic world. But uh, due to the diversity of uh, societies and variety of beliefs, I, I personally believe that there is no one single model of leadership that is applicable to all. But nevertheless, in order to, to fully understand the Christian leadership, there is no better model than the Jesus model. Um, and that is on self-sacrificing and serving others as a result of his unconditional love. And this love is expressed with the sacrificial crucifixion. So the cross of Jesus Christ is not a symbol of impoverishment, but of victory over the forces of mortality. And the salvific revelation of God in Christ does not operate on the level of dominion and pride, but on the level of, uh, of creation, or more accurately, of recreation and new creation. So the sacrificial offering of the body and blood of Jesus cleanses from sin as long as it's freely desired by anyone who wants to experience the new creation, the resurrected reality of immortality. So a theology of leadership which contains serving and sacrificing for the other is not identified with a moral improvement, but is an ontological change of man to the life in Christ. 
I quote Mark Wano, if any human being wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. So this action of unselfish love stands in opposition to any secular understanding of leadership. The secular understanding of leadership, and this may uh, remind you some things, contains uh, order, power, and authority. And I quote again Matthew 20, you know that the rulers of the nations exercise power over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you shall be your bond servant. As the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So in the orthodox context, I don't know how if we can speak, at least this is how things were understood in the past in orthodox reality. What describes a faith-based leader is the well-known picture of the so-called upside-down pyramid. And Christ is in the top of this pyramid. And those who choose to follow him must aim to reach this top. And Christ is the high priest. And even though in the liturgical life of the Orthodox Church, priesthood sometimes erroneously identified only, only with the ordained clergy, all the baptized faithful are understood as priests, the so-called royal priesthood leaders. So this defines also the responsibility that all faithful should have towards all people. And in a more holistic approach, like Professor Zakorski mentioned, towards all creation, this responsibility that we should all have. So of course, the higher orders like bishops, presbyters, deacons, uh, to be distinguished from a great number of lower orders existed from the very beginning. But their duty was to preside and not to exercise a priestly function. And the priestly function is exercised by Jesus Christ. And the priest or bishop, when celebrating the Eucharist, is not a mediator between God and humanity, but acts in persona Christi. So the primate in the church should be a primate of service and sacrifice. So this picture of an upside down pyramid represents clearly the elevation to the top in the hierarchy of the church. And therefore this elevation in the ecclesiastical pyramid has a a self-emptying, a chaotic character. So the clergy and especially the bishops exist in the church, not only in persona Christi, istopon Christu, but also in imitation as a type of Christ, of Christ, is typon Christu. And they are all called to empty themselves in order to carry the burden of others and render visible the presence of Christ among the faithful. Now, what about the theology of leadership and the neighbor, which actually is the, the main thing I'd like to discuss today. So in a multi-religious and a multicultural society, people of different historical and national backgrounds live with concrete cultural identities that everybody should respect. And those those diversities are increasing. And this raises the question, how can we face this diversity based in a theology of leadership? And the answer lies, at least in my concern, in the concept of the religious hospitality, the philoxenia. And nowadays, under the light of universalism, the fact that we are also citizens of one world, this cannot be ignored. So the religious hospitality we demonstrate is identified with the image of embracing the other in her or his otherness. So since I refer to religious hospitality, and it's worth noting that religious otherness is easier to forget when we are hosts in a society, the big majority, and easier to remember when we are guests, the small minority. And to take it one step further, 
it should not even be a question of majority and minority in a society. We should also overcome this fear of diversity, which comes as a result of fanaticism, intolerance, and the perception of truth as dogmatism. So the multiculturalism of modern society leaves no room for confinement to our ego. So when we transcend our individuality, we acknowledge our otherness and thus accept it as a necessary component of society. So in order to coexist harmoniously in the same environment as leaders, all of us, it is necessary to overcome monism and accept the otherness of others. And of course, compassion and love as expressed in the sacred texts and traditions of Christianity is not limited to the narrow boundaries that we humans often set, loving and respecting our brother, our friend, our fellow citizen, but extends to shared experiences with people of also different religious beliefs. So through a noble dialogue, we listen to the others, to their prayers, their testimonies, and share their anxiety for peace, harmony, and reconciliation, because this is how we can respond to the phenomenon of religious pluralism in a world that is constantly changing both religiously and culturally. However, religious freedoms not be confused with religious tolerance, which sometimes can serve as a mask for unjust behavior and promote social inequality. There is also a need for a more, now I'm getting to the, to the uh, comment of Professor Vasiliadis, uh, there is also this uh, need for a more active leadership that will raise awareness that diaconia, Professor Zakovsky also mentioned this, that is not an optional action, but is a duty. It is the praxis of the church that authenticates its message and not vice versa. An example of such life in communities presented clearly in the Trinitarian uh, theology, uh, the same hypothesis of the divinity is a paradigm of life in community and the intervention of God in history aims to lead humanity and all creation to be one with the very existence of God. And also the concept of the uh, well-known among theological circles, liturgy, after the liturgy that was first introduced by Ion Bria, offers this opening of Christian life for public and political realm in a unique way. And as Bria notes, the church has to struggle for the fulfillment of that justice and freedom, which was promised by God to all men. And it has constantly to give account of how the kingdom of heaven is or is not within it. It has to ask herself if by the conservatism of its worship may appear to support the violation of human rights inside and outside the Christian community. And of course, many people believe, and in many cases, I would say they are right, that the church is betrayed by its leaders, the church hierarchy, every time they abuse their leadership role and position, and every time they show an arrogant conviction that they are the only bearers of God's grace. We should all keep in mind that it is God who reconciles, and human beings actually participate in God's mission, both in an internal level and externally. And however, this does not presuppose that we should remain silent in front of actions that lead to human impoverishment and passively tolerate injustice, and not only condemn inappropriate actions far from Christian ethos, but work but actively work towards a reconciliation. So faith-based leaders are losing their credibility when they cannot explain to people what church is or what faith demands. And if the church performs, conducts her salvific ministry, not by her actions or by her teachings, but primarily by what she is quoting my professor, Professor Vasiliadis, then it is quite natural that her being, in other words, 
her identity and self-consciousness should correspond and indeed fully to what to that which she represents. And what the church depicts is no other than the vision of the awaited kingdom of God that is the vision of a new world different from the perishable and conventional one which we live. If I want to sum up, and I'm closing now my short uh, comment, if I want to sum up the theology of leadership in a religious diverse world, I could use two quotes from two theologians which should be seen as connected. The one is from the well-known Russian theologian Alexander Smerman, that Christian love is the possible impossibility to see Christ in another man, whoever he is, and whom God, in his eternal and mysterious plan, has decided to introduce into my life, be it only for a few moments, not as an occasion for a good deed or an exercise in philanthropy, but as the beginning of an eternal companionship in God himself. And the second quote is from the Metropolitan of Lebanon, George Codro, that we should seek to identify the Christic values in other religions and awaken the Christ who sleeps in the night of the religions. So as a final remark, I would like to say that it is not enough for faith-based leaders, to clergy and laity, men and women, just to theologize, to talk on the vision of justice and peace, to talk of on non-violence, but to put theory into practice. So the possible impossibility of Smerman should become a liability and a responsibility towards people of other religions as understood by Coder. We are living in this new era of globalization, which has brought people together, and at the same time pointed to the diversity of the several pluralistic environments. And it is our duty to create safe places and reconciling and reconciled communities. Our vision must be to form such communities, and in other words, to make again the church what she really is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicolae. Uh, I think uh, with your interreligious interfaith dimension of your presentation, give uh, 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 what uh, the main uh, questions posed uh, in the, the YouTube to Antoine. And uh, Antoine is now. Uh, you to respond both to this question by the by your two colleagues and to those who have been posted on the youtube antoine thank you very much F first of all i would like to say that it's also a joy for me to be in dialogue with uh, professor kravchuk and uh, uh, with nikolaos uh, dimitriadis uh, I hope also to have the opportunity to continue this discussion uh, on other platforms. And um, I, I, I agree with what have been said from Professor Kravchuk for, uh, to start with. Um, I agree that it is, uh, we should be careful also on this question of uh, the language of victimization. And this is why we, I, launched a commission on truth, justice, and reconciliation between Russia and Ukraine. In 2018, 2019, we published a document with 10 proposals. And the first proposal was to write together a joint history with Russian historians and Ukrainian historians. Because um, uh, I don't believe in the Karamzin uh, understanding of the past the historian of Nikolai I, the Tsar, but I don't believe also in the vision of uh, Hrushevsky, the Ukrainian historian. I believe much more in the idea of joint um, crossed looks on the past from historians, both from Russia and Ukraine with the help of Western historians. And that will uh, help to write uh, a joint narrative 
which will uh, avoid this double uh, temptation, both of imperialism and of uh, victimization. So I agree with you, but it is also necessary to say also that there is perpetrator, perpetrators, as you said, of the aggression and there are victims. So it is also true to recognize the, who started the, the war in 2014 and 2022, because um, this is um, important to make a judgment at the end. Um, I agree also with what uh, Nikolaos uh, Dimitriadis has said about the, 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 the importance of a Christian leadership. He insisted, you insisted on the idea of serving and sacrificing as the characteristics of uh, the Christian leaderships. And I agree with this. I would add also that the, the, the good leader is the leader who is thankful. This is an idea that comes from the Ukrainian philosopher Skovoroda. Uh, la reconnaissance, to be thankful. It's also a quality of the leaders and it's also part of the Orthodox faith of glorifying God and, and then giving joy and then giving openness. Uh, and also the, the characteristic of a Christian leadership for me is also to say truth and to organize justice. And the problem is that we don't have enough altogether this idea of, uh, uh, as you said, serving sacrifice and sacrificing ourselves, but also glorifying and, and organize justice. And this is why the Orthodox Church particularly is quite weak to organize, um, for instance, big charities, international charities or uh, universities and so on. It's, it's a problem that we, we are not enough insisting on the four dimension of, uh, of the church um, and of the Orthodox faith as a faithful memory, uh, uh, right glorification, the fair justice, and um, and moral truth. We need four uh, to hold together the four understanding of uh, orthodoxy. Uh, well, this is I, what I suggest, and that means practically that we need to today to say there is a heresy in Russia with this uh, uh, idea of uh, Ruskimir, of the Russian world. And if we have enough boldness to say that, audacity to say that, then the next step is to judge the, the, the people who are promoting these heresy. It was done in the past during the first millennium when there were ecumenical councils, there were judgment against Arius, uh, against the different heretics. So today we need also to judge the people in the Moscow Patriarchate who are promoting these heresies. Uh, I think it's orthodox to say that also. It's a, a leadership which would be appreciated from everybody. And I would like to answer to a question that was uh, put on the, on the YouTube about the possibility of ecumenical metaphysics to be as a tool for interreligious dialogues. Of course, this is one of the main chapter of my book I, I'm studying all the interreligious dialogues between Judaism and Christianity, Christianity and Islam, Buddhism and Christianity, and so on. And it helps to have this personalist approach, this sociological approach, and this Trinitarian approach. Um, there is another Christian Orthodox philosopher who is using, for, for me, an ecumenical metaphysics and who is um, applying this ecumenical metaphysics not only to interreligious dialogue but to a trans-religious dialogue. As I said, uh, we need a transdisciplinarity, we need a trans-confessional approach, we need also a trans-religious approach. And this Christian um, Orthodox philosopher is um, 
David Bentley Hart. I recommend you to read his books also because he, he gives very interesting insights in this new approach of trans-religious dialogue. So I think I, I answered to the questions and I would like to thank you again very much for this opportunity, Petros, that you gave me. I am very thankful and I wish you all the best. Thank you also to Nicolaos and Andri. Uh, thank you, Antoine. Uh, it, the, the pleasure is ours and the gratefulness to you is uh, uh, more than uh, evident. And we are very thankful that we have decided at least to close this series with uh, this, uh, um, I mean, a little bit uh, further challenging uh, uh, presentations. And quickly I will give uh, for a short uh, second uh, thought to the floor to Andre and then to Nikolaos who will close uh, uh, this whole year, academic year's uh, uh, series. Andre. Few words. Yes. before closing. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to hear from uh, Antoine, your, your uh, comments to my comments. And uh, I, I do hope and believe that we will have and look forward to the opportunity to, uh, to dialogue with you again. Um, many, many areas of interest. It's a very, very rich presentation that you made um, the, the issue of judgment, again, takes us back to a very important uh, a practical moment that, that is being faced. And it is also, in a, a psychological sense, a therapeutic step which must take place in the healing process. Uh, the other uh, dimension that I would bring into a discussion is uh, the element of forgiveness and the readiness to forgive. Uh, the perpetrator will need forgiveness and will maybe in, in some individual persons be seeking that forgiveness even now. Uh, I have seen interviews with people uh, uh, who uh, are Russians uh, uh, living in different parts of the world who are in tears uh, over what is happening and uh, they are in fact seeking uh, forgiveness, uh, and um, it is important, I think, to to have the 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 tools and the and the means and the leadership uh, of the churches that uh, that is capable of addressing that with courage, because the, there is a strong pull uh, on the part of some people who have not yet processed this trauma, a pull towards hatred, a pull towards calling names and, and using terms that, that continue to divide. Uh, so people, uh, until the healing has taken place, they are not ready, they are not equipped to do that. And I think the, the responsibility of churches and leaders and, uh, and ecumenical metaphysics is to, is to help to clarify what is going on, not just on the battlefield, but in human minds and hearts, what is being transformed and what is being challenged uh, so that we can be on the right track uh, for the future. So I, I will keep that to uh, the minimum. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to participate. Thank you, Andre. <laughs> Your presence and Antoine's are symbolic and intentional. Uh, first, because uh, we share with Antoine uh, <coughs> the, the hope for a reconciliation, uh, the way he has uh, explained it uh, a little bit earlier, and also your presence um, uh, coming from the uh, Greek Catholic uh, Ukrainian uh, community, is also important because uh, I have realized that the difficulty, the winter of uh, ecumenical movement was due mainly to the insistence of the Russian Orthodox Church uh, to demonize the unionism. For me, it, is, it was a blessing that uh, 
you can become, uh, let's say, um, um, collaborator towards uh, um, church unity, the way uh, described by Antoine. Uh, and by the way, let me remind uh, you and uh, our uh, viewers and audience that uh, we as a Center of Ecumenical, Missiological and Environmental Studies uh, have launched also a similar reconciliation uh, uh, project, Ukrainian Christian, Ukrainian Orthodox Reconciliation Project, uh, similar to Antoine's, but I I'm not so, so optimistic, uh, uh, Antoine, whether you can work together with the Russians uh, and have a jointly written again historiography of the so-called uh, 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 Ross. Uh, because uh, we have experienced in, in, uh, in our area, in Greece, uh, a neighboring Turkey to try to write again uh, the history uh, handbooks to the stu uh, students. And we realized that uh, uh, neither side are ready because of nationalistic or other uh, uh, issues uh, are ready to come to a common conclusion. Uh, before uh, you uh, will close, uh, Nikolaos, uh, allow me to ask again uh, uh, Antoine whether, because I have heard uh, his presentation about uh, the historiography, which is completely different uh, in Ukraine, and he said, and he said this, uh, the historiography written by Ukrainian and uh, the historiography. Uh, written by the Russians. Do you have any hope that uh, uh, with this uh, Ruski Mir and uh, because this is, this is a narrative that is uh, very essential for the Russian regime uh, to continue, not to work together, even in the, in the foreseeable future. Antoine. Yes, it is possible, Petros. There are lots of uh, good um, Russian historians who were ready to start the work. Uh, our problem is that we, we, we didn't have enough uh, financial supports. But if I would be uh, supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for instance, I asked to the French embassy to support. They didn't answer because for them it was not a priority. And today, they, they need to spend billions of dollars and euros in order to send uh, uh, soldiers or uh, uh, military weapons in, in Ukraine. What we were asking was, you know, uh, 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 very few. We had people, for instance, from uh, Memorial, the NGO Memorial, who were ready to participate with Ukrainian historians. Uh, Andrei Zubov, for instance, the well-known Russian historian and orthodox thinker, he was ready to share and to, to, to work together with uh, Ukrainian historians from the UKU, the Ukrainian Catholic University, from the Mogila Academy. You know, they are ready. The problem is that nobody is interested in it and nobody sees the importance of narratives in order to make peace. We know it is crucial between France and Germany, we could make peace because we wrote together a textbook with French and German historians. There will be no peace between Russia and Ukraine if there will not be this textbook. So I hope we will I, find I fully, some... I fully agree. Unless education proceeds, war will never stop. Uh, Nicolae, uh, can you uh, sum up now the whole uh, series and close uh, this beautiful today's uh, evening? Yeah, I'm uh, also yeah, I'm grateful I was present in this. Actually, even if it was the last moment, uh, you were right. Uh, I'm grateful I was present in this day's presentation. Many things uh, uh, came up. 
I will, I will close uh, the, the sessions of the Open Public Lectures, thanking again everyone for the participation. And uh, with uh, a comment and a short wish, if I may. So we have this feeling that there is a fight because, you know, this is now a trend, right? We were watching the, in television the, the war like it is another Facebook event. So, but we have the feeling that there is a fight among religions or among nations or among different interpretations of Christian worldviews, but the believers are losing their lives. Let's don't forget that. And uh, I think also it is widely accepted uh, a historical fact actually that in the past, but nowadays also as well, religion and the so-called institutionalized faith provided a motive for animosity between people. I think by the same time, faith or religion has the internal dynamics, if I may say, to heal the traumas and the tensions caused by those errors. And I think we all have this responsibility not to remain indifferent that also the other participants mentioned throughout the open public, lecture, public lectures. We have all the responsibility not to remain indifferent to the uh, needs of people today. And when I say people in a more um, inclusive, let's say more inclusivistic language. So thank you very much uh, for everything. We see you uh, a nice evening and I uh, hope to see you again soon. And on my part, uh, as a director of the master program in Orthodox Ecumenical Theology, I would like to thank you all, and I'm referring to all uh, speakers, all those who participated, either by presenting uh, um, a paper or commenting uh, on uh, another paper. And especially, I am grateful to you, uh, uh, Professors uh, Azakovsky and uh, Kravchuk, because uh, uh, you have brought us what I believe that uh, Ukraine is and will remain in the foreseeable, at least future, the center of the world, not only the uh, because of uh, the autocephaly issue or the war that is uh, uh, underway, but because it is a place where the first division between Western and Eastern was uh, actually uh, developed in this area of the present Ukrainian-Russian um, uh, uh, conflict. And it is the same place where a uh, hope can come, especially with the help also and the contribution of the uh, Greek Catholics for our main goal to proceed to the way to live again the one Church of Christ. Thank you very much and uh, good night also to our viewers and listeners. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.